Um, it is my honor to introduce today's distinguished speaker, that's William C. Brunfeld, whose lifelong dedication to documenting Russian architecture has preserved a visual history of cultural transformation and elevated photography as an act of immediacy and introspection. A proud alumnus of Tulane University, Brumfield's fascination with Russian literature began in the deep American South and led him to a career that has taken him across Russia's vast landscapes. His remarkable work spans over 150,000 images that capture the delicate balance between preservation and decay, offering an unflinching look at the art of catastrophe. Professor Brumfield's photographs are more than documentation, and this is part of what we bonded over at the start. They capture the immediacy of the present and echo a, a quote I love from Ralph Waldo Emerson, the invariable mark of wisdom is to see the miraculous in the common. His work invites us to witness the miraculous in every dome, arc, and crumbling facade. It is fitting that he sits here at Tulane University Libraries given his long-standing connection to libraries, including significant work with the Library of Congress. We are grateful for his recent donation of four stunning prints to the Howard Tilton Memorial Library, which inspired today's talk. This presentation, Above the Abyss, Photography and the Art of Catastrophe, will be recorded and preserved in the Tulane University Digital Library, one of my favorite acronyms, TOODLE, um, ensuring, <laughs> ensuring that his insights endure. Since my first day at Tulane, William has been more than a colleague. He has been an advocate whose friendship to the libraries means the world. Today, we celebrate not just his academic contributions, but also his enduring impact on our community. Please join me in welcoming William Brumfield to today's talk. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, my connection with uh, Howard Tilton Library goes back uh, almost 100 years. <laughs> Almost a century. Well, the math doesn't quite work out for that, but it's, let's just say several decades. And uh, this library is such a gift. I know and have seen the contributions, often unnoticed by the people who serve in this library, uh, and I think the library is in a very good place now. Uh, enormously important, and I just like to I uh, give my heartfelt thanks to the people who continue to support my work at Howard Tilton and Associated Libraries. Uh, the photographs that uh, will be represented today are from a project, a collection that I entitled uh, Lost America. Uh, that project exists as a Tulane WordPress document uh, created by two of my student assistants, uh, Macy King and Charleston McLean. Uh, I should say that Tulane students over the past uh, two and a half decades, when I began digitization of my collection, Tulane students have made an enormous, incalculable contribution to my work. I think in many ways they themselves do not realize because they have active lives of their own, but how much they have contributed to my work, including the recent uh, Tulane Digital Library a project of the William C. Brumfield Collection. Uh, again, now available globally because of the efforts of Tulane's Howard Tilton Library. So my deepest appreciation to the students uh, who have helped me uh, over the decades preserve work that has taken me across uh, Europe and Asia from one end of Russia to the other. And yes, the director of the Library of Congress, uh, Jim Billington, uh, also made uh, an extraordinary contribution to my work. When, in fact, he, uh, his contribution was so great that he sent me to Siberia <laughs> more than once and it changed my life. And that work must be preserved and shared. And the libraries are at the center of all of that. Well, um, uh, the photographs in the Lost America Project were the most part taken 50 years ago uh, when I was an assistant professor at Harvard and a very conflicted and angst and anxiety ridden and alienated as assistant professors often are, uh, particularly in such a golden environment as Harvard, at least in those days. 
And it was a difficult time for Boston generally, as you've seen from films such as The Departed. Late 1970s was a tough time, tough time in Boston. Uh, but photography, it seemed to me, when I uh, began to photograph, and I wouldn't have started photographing without my trips to Russia as a graduate student from Berkeley, UC Berkeley, uh, back in the early 70s. And I said, you're on to something here. Uh, but, okay, well, I can go photograph Russia, but what about photography itself? What is it? What is its essence? And searching in the often troubled landscape around Boston uh, allowed me to explore what I thought would be the essence of photography as a form of art, an essence that uh, uh, Lindsay beautifully illustrated with her quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, transcendentalism, very important. Thank you for such a great introduction. Um, this notion of meaning in the forgotten. We create things and then abandon them, but they have a life that continues, and a meaning that continues. So I began to explore that um, from my perch in Cambridge. Uh, and I uh, thought, and some of these thoughts I'm applying retroactively. I can't say that I conceptualized everything at the moment, but that was the impulse. What can photography do? How can it surprise us? How can it shock us? Uh, now, there have been many people who have written about the art of photography. Uh, Susan Sontag, uh, Janet Malcolm, Henri Cartier-Bresson, uh, Roland Barthes, whom I'll quote later today. Uh, and all of this is very valuable, and this only is the beginning of, of uh, the commentary that's been written on this curious art form. But I wanted to start with something a bit more basic, and then go from physics to metaphysics. Because this thing called photography is a gathering of photons, uh, through mechanical means, projected on a chemically treated surface, at least originally. There, of course, is human agency, but there's also the mechanical, that control which is emblematic of the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. And you create, after all, photography means writing with light. You create in this gathering of photons on a surface a unique moment, a moment that is absolutely unique. No one else was at that exact place, at that exact time, at that moment that we recorded. And this goes back to 13.7 billion years ago. So that uh, this notion of the decisive moment, as Cartier-Bresson, when he applied it, he meant to catch a, a person in motion. This was also applied to Robert Frank's photography, that, that unguarded moment, that precise moment. But I can see the decisive moment in another context. Every moment is, in fact, a decisive moment. Some are more decisive than others. And that involves not only the object photographed at that precise moment, but also the observer, which is quantum physics tells us is also a part of the thing measured. And then there is the observer of the object recorded. So there are two levels of observation, the photographer and the person looking at the photograph. So in this vast continuum, and we as humans are very large, we front a very large process in nature, including the origins of life itself. Uh, this I think should be extended, could be extended, from the concept of the unique moment, the decisive moment, as the observer defines it. Now, um, yes, this large process that humans represented, 
the fact that every atom of iron in our bodies derives from a supernova explosion some 10 billion years ago. And then we had the formation of our solar system and its evolution from a fiery molten mass in what is known as the Hadean Eon from 4.5 billion years ago to 4 billion years ago. And then you have the Archean Eon, when things cool and dry land was separated from the waters. In my project, Lost America, the fifth section is called Archean Motifs. And most of the photographs there were taken in Maine in the summers of 1975 and 1976, when I visited my dear friends Ruf, uh, Rufus and Murray Matheson who had a house in Blue Hill Bay. So most of the photographs uh, in, the lost, in the Archean Motifs section of Lost America are studies of the meeting of granite, igneous rock, fire turned solid, and water. And you see here the process of that wave gently lapping the darker color where the moisture reaches on the rock and the fissures within the rock. All of that created by hundreds of thousands and millions of years. It's extraordinary creation. The world continually changes, as the Greek philosophers told us, it is continually evolving and changing. Can photography capture a moment that indicates that process. This notion of creation and decay of complex structures, the second law of thermodynamics, entropy, and yet the rising of structures within that process, decay itself creating new forms, weathering, abrasion, all of this is something that each one of us, every moment of our lives, fronts. The process that led to the miracle of our creation. And I might refer to you, by the way, to if those of you are interested in further work of Sarah Imari Walker, professor of physics at Arizona State University, particular, particularly her book recently, Life as No One knows it. So we are continuously in a process of history, each moment of our existence. Oh, um, as we go through this investigation of the mystery and miracle of the moment, uh, I'd like to uh, quote from Roland Barthes' work, Camera Lucida. What pricks me is the discovery of this equivalence. In front of the photograph of my mother as a child, I tell myself she is going to die. I shudder over a catastrophe which has already occurred. Whether or not the subject is already dead. Every photograph is this catastrophe. You see before you a photograph taken 80 years ago, the end of 1944, Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm looking straight into that little Kodak Brownie box camera. Miracle of a photograph taken by my father. You know, my mother's radiant face. There I am, just looking right into the camera, 80 years ago. Photography as catastrophe, in the deepest, most metaphysical sense. The photographs that I'm going to show you now really fall into two categories. One, the iconic. 
things that signal an essential being, but in an unfamiliar context, and other photographs that indicate process, that situate us in a time, but also suggest the weathering, the abrasion, the change before the photograph was taken, and intimations of that process continuing after the photograph. Photograph is situated within a temporal continuum. Uh, just to give one more example of Bart's idea, this is a photograph taken in color by Sergei Prokudin Gorsky in 1911 in the town of Bielozersk in Russia. So complicated three uh, exposure process. Uh, the, uh, the treated glass plate dropped down three times and was exposed with different filters that an assistant changed so that you got the separation of cyan, magenta, and yellow. And you can see the young infant there. She's not behaving herself in the lower left. She turns her head so that her head comes out magenta, cyan, and yellow. All of the other children are beautifully composed, looking into the setting sun as the camera takes this picture. Their chances were not good. Catastrophe in the most awful and harrowing sense of the word. How many of them would live through the next decade of war, revolution, famine, terror, following by collectivization, and then, for those who survive, meeting the Second World War. And yet, the photograph itself, which is a part of my book, Journeys Through the Russian Empire, is so serene and so beautiful and so calm, captured at that unique moment, as Bart so deeply expressed it. Well, the iconic. When I had my show, Lost America, at the uh, Shusev National Museum of Architecture in Moscow last summer, uh, this proved to be one of the most popular photographs. It was reproduced everywhere. I call it intrusion. I just drove off a, a road in North Carolina, Chatham County, which is where my mother was born in 1917 and my grandparents lived. So I'm just driving this huge clunker of a machine. And there was a spot where there was a little asphalt left and the reflection off of the car window and everything, it was like, what is it doing there? How did it get there? And so the Russians responded. This, I can't tell you how many times in national newspapers, this photograph, which I call intrusion, the machine in the garden was reproduced. They got it. They understood it. Um, I'm sorry that we couldn't have made a postcard of that. We do have postcards, by the way, for all of you to pick up uh, as you uh, leave or whenever. Uh, the postcards themselves are works of art. The postcards are so beautiful that I've met people who actually didn't realize they were advertising a lecture. Oh, you're giving a lecture. <laughs> Please take and keep, only if you promise to keep, in any event. So, the machine in the garden, the icon, unexpected mysterious, or this advertising sign in Melbourne, Florida, where my sister, my dear sister, uh, lived, still lives, and where my mother is buried. Melbourne, an advertisement for uh, a paint store, and I made a pun, because you can't really see the T, so I said Southern Pain, Southern Pain, who doesn't know it, who's grown up in the South, uh, but it's that it's that intersection of cloud at the top and the paintbrush. That's the mystery of that moment. It's a very complex vectored structure. It's completed by that. Well, some of you could tell me what sort of cloud that is, but the way it intersects with the dynamic of the paintbrush itself, mystery. The, the delight of seeing common things in an unexpected 
juxtaposition. But this was on the cover of my book, which uh, we, I forgot to bring, Lost America, um, which was published in connection with my exhibit in Russia. It's a mirror that I saw against a, um, a house that has a weekend uh, antique sale uh, near Northfield, Vermont. I love New England. And there you can see in that mirror just all of America, the big clunker of a car, the flag in the background, and of course, reverse, since it's a mirror, antiques. America, a youthful uh, culture fascinated with antiques. Part of this weekend ritual. And it was all caught there in that mirror. The flag is perfectly unfolded. Again, the moment that the photographer brings to it. But then the observer who sees this photograph brings a certain meaning that is the product of all of your experiences, all of your development as you contemplate this one instant recorded by a, a mechanical instrument, which we call a camera. The flag is perfect. The flag is everything in this photograph caught on a mirror. The title of this photograph is Through the Looking Glass. Also, Northfield, Vermont. The half shell. The visual pun. Things that are forgotten that are in the process of decay, shadowed glass, an old abandoned jeep, and the half shell, art on the half shell. This sense of mystery and transcendental meaning in things that have been forgotten, beautifully punning, off that juxtaposition, somebody putting an old shell sign. It's there for the alienated observer seeking meaning in an angst-ridden life. Or this view of Dudley Square, uh, Roxbury near the Orange Line, now called Nubian Square. Again, Roxbury was in a difficult place in the 1970s, redlining, many abandoned buildings, but the vitalism of the street art of that period. And you see the figure of the bicycle, of the cyclist coming through that landscape shadowed by the orange line, which has now been torn down, by the way. The orange line is no longer elevated. But the mystery of that particular moment, the cyclist coming through that explosion of color None of this exists anymore. It's all been torn down by the urban redevelopment of the area around what is now known Nubian Square, then known Dublin Square. But the power, the poetry, the joy of this particular confluence of vectors, of lines, of colors, and that cyclist making his way mysteriously, ghostly, through that landscape, that urban scape, or a pure study in culture, uh, uh, color. Um, uh, Mount Auburn Avenue, right next to uh, Adams House at Harvard, built in the 1920s for the, the offspring of the wealthiest segments of American society. And in this explosion of color, if you look at it now, if you go to Google Map, it is so sad. It has become an elegant, elegant gray. Why? Why destroy that? This explosion. And of course, it's Sunday morning. I like Sunday morning because no one was there. Get people out of the picture. The only people that are in the pictures are African Americans who live in these territories without really owning them, but they are there. They are their space, particularly the Roxbury series of Lost America. Here in Sunday morning, pizza, submarines, 
and then your rush laundry for the most favored sons and now daughters of American society. I love it, but today, so sad. Color has been eradicated in favor of severity. Where are we going? Or these other street um, uh, uh, compositions, uh, paint thrown on uh, a, um, a space for political posters, and one of them says, strike, arch. So 1970s was a time of political radicalism, radical activism. Never led to much, but uh, they were certainly very vocal. You can see the strike arch there behind. Decontextualized words in a weathered surface that I, I brought to that positioning of that space at that moment but it is an indication of process, of weathering, of abrasion. And this decontextualizing of words, I think particularly from, uh, uh, fascinating. The poster there is from the Spartacus League. Some of you might know who Spartacus was, I and mean, then Spartacus was a hero of revolutionary socialism. You can see the Spar Spartak on the left. And I call this Marxist analysis, because those are the words that I see that have been brought to the fore by this process of ripping and tearing and layering new words being imposed on this surface. Not now, the postcard. This compelling, Dynamic, but I stood there and determined which of those fragments would come into the picture, quite literally. And these were taken on a medium format camera, by the way, with 120 medium. So the detail, you can see the staples, you can see the nail head. This was on the fire doors of Harvard Square Theater, now no longer in existence. But those iron fire doors were an endless source of inspiration for me. The, again, the ripping and the creation of new forms through abrasion uh, in that context. Now here is an abandoned brewery built probably in the 1910s uh, in Roxbury. Something monumental and extraordinary of this ruined, now long gone building with its chimneys soaring up, tooth-like in the sky. And I went inside and found this dance of color inside this building. Oh, you can compare it to Matisse, you can compare it to whichever you want, but the power of color, but particularly color here by the open, the freezing and warming of an unheated, uncared for space creating through myself as the observer presented to you the joy of movement and color as 20th century artists taught us to appreciate. And the folds of the paint, how it, they, they fold back on themselves, the cracks, the fissures, the rows of paint as they come apart under the impact of the elements, the process that our entire world goes through every moment of its existence. But we capture that decisive moment. Or the moment of things randomly left when we are no longer there. This is in the courtyard of Leverett House after a graduation ceremony. I call it the colloquy of the chairs. The chairs now themselves take over. They are the ones who matter. They are imbued, I would like to say, with a mysterious existence. The ripples of Walden Pond, that moment capturing an evanescent presence, evanescent presence, ripples, themselves miracles of 
chaos reflecting here light. Sandfish, Cape Cod. You can still see rivulets of water running off in the lower left hand. The extraordinary beauty of a, an apparently random ordering of elements. But I framed it. It is something that, as it were, caught the eye. This notion of catching the eye is a very powerful um, uh, way of explaining the power of this mechanical thing we know as a camera capturing that decisive moment. Vermont lace caught in the snow melting, just enough to reveal the beauty of nature's random ramifications, ramifying as those uh, twigs do from a, a substance that was animated at one point with sap in life and creating all of those patterns the notion of eternal change caught in this strange period, or this, I call it, first prize, grand prize, I think was the title that came up. In other words, an attempt uh, on the uh, concrete wall of uh, what was in my sister's house, this abandoned spindly plant, all of, or these weedy trees in an abandoned wall in Roxbury. All of these photographs from the mid and late 1970s. You can see the dancing shadows on the wall. The beauty in forgotten, overgrown, weedy places. The camera allows us to capture in that moment. Or the overgrown. A gas station in Cambridge, a gas station overgrown, taken back, as everything we create will ultimately be taken back. Everything. You see the sumac, or who is for sumac? Uh, I think there are two pronunciations of it. Growing there over the two lights that used to enliven the tanks that allowed us to move in our social getting and spending. Then back to Archean motifs, the rocks in Maine, I think particularly if we can go back to, yes, this one I particularly like, all four of the uh, elements, Heraclitan elements, uh, air, soil, earth, water, and fire, they're igneous rocks, that's the fire, uh, all of that, coming to place, reflected. And over on the upper left-hand corner, that's the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean. And you have that pool in which the trees are reflected. There we go. Well, why not? Oh, well, that's just very good. Let's go back, actually, a couple. We missed a couple. That's, that's, that's so, yeah, can you go back? We, we missed a couple of the, uh, yeah, but I wanted to go back. <laughs> I wanted to go back. Uh, yes, oh yes, jars, jars. Just your jars arranged in an abandoned storefront in Cambridge near Central Square. You can see the rust taken on a medium format. You can see the rusted top. And it's taken through glass, and you can see the snow reflected in the glass. It's like on a winter day. So this play of what's on which side of the glass, which is which side of the looking glass, reflection upon reflection going in and out, the vectoring uh, which I set up, the jars on this glass plane. Who did that? Who did that extraordinary thing, piling those old abandoned mason jars in that 
Shopwinka. Mystery. And yet, it tells us so much about the beauty of common things that we discard and forget. Ah, this, which I called Noche Ulitsa von Night Street a Lamp, a work by the great Russian symbolist poem Gluck. This was taken shortly after the death of my father in January 19, 75. And it reminds me of the quote from Letting Run of Speak Memory. The cradle rocks above the abyss, and common sense tells us that our existence is but a brief crack of light between eternities, between two eternities of darkness. You can see the fresh snow fallen there, darkness on one side, the vector of the lamp, the icicles hanging down from the street light, and two sets of tracks, one in the center going off to upper left, a dog has passed by there, and the other footprints of a human walking along the sidewalk into darkness. The power the beauty of that moment and the fence with its iron pickets, all vectoring in a composition that I just happened pensively to look out and capture the street light itself. Well, there's so much that I could say about that. Or this, brick wall in Cambridge, I call that koan, riddle, contemplate, silently, stillly, texture, shadow, what's real and what's the illusion. Thank you so much for letting me go back and see those photographs. I'm not sure how that happened, but I'm happy that it allowed us to explore in a free way the transcendental impact, or this violent collision of sedimentary and igneous rock, or this, I call this torso, granite, layered on granite, shaped by tens of thousands of years of wave action, and of course, freezing and warming as the seasons this, taking that segment, catching the eye. And if you go to um, the WordPress document, you'll see other forms of this same process of creation, erosion, abrasion, new epiphanies, new insights. Now this takes us to a large steel plant in a steel town, Chirapavets in Russia. Um, I wanted to put that in a book, and the editors uh, on Chirapavets, the editor said, no, you can't do that because this is the year of ecology, and this would give the wrong impression. Oh, God. <laughs> so, the extraordinary, this is a pour. This is a steel pour. Right? Those of you who live near a steel town, it's being poured. There you can see the sulfur plume that comes off from the action of the water on the, uh, the fusion of the iron into steel, the transformation of pig iron into steel, an enormous amount of water, air that creates a new substance. But it's the joy of that yellow plume, the sulfur coming out. It's sort of a, as the Italians would say in Renaissance painting, sfumato, mm -hmm. sfumato. That cloud, that existence between solid, liquid, and gas.
this mystery of transformation of that, the camera, uniquely allows us to present. I'd like to conclude with a quote from the American poet Gary Snyder. The world is nature, and in the long run, inevitably wild, because the wild, as the process and essence of nature, is also an ordering of impermanence. Photography is, I would submit, in its essence, an ordering of impermanence. Photography, the art of photography, gives us that unique moment that becomes a portal into eternity. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'd love to have questions, comments, critique. Yes. When you took these photos 40, no, 50 years ago, did you have the similar views then that you have now? And yeah. Yes, this is something, uh, and I'm, I'm not uh, I'm implying a criticism, no, no shaming here, but I did talk about this before you came in. <laughs> 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 Professor Horowitz. <laughs> <laughs> no shaming, no shaming, but yes, I, I, I did. No, it's a, it's a valid point, and I, that's why I addressed it at the beginning of my talk. No, I did not. A lot of this is implied retroactively, and yet, who's to say? I mean, the process of creation is so uh, mysterious, and I said the essential was being alienated, angst-ridden as an assistant professor at Harvard, being in a golden bubble, and yet knowing that this would burst, and going to out of that uh, to strange abandoned places uh, to get that, what, what catches my eye? So I think uh, I'd like to say retroactively, maybe I understood it then and only now am I verbalizing. That's the mystery right there, yes. And these mics don't project, they're just for recording, so oh, okay. uh, yes. <laughs> Bill, thank you so much for that really beautiful um, discussion and analysis of the, po of the poetry of the photographs, and they're a really beautiful series of works, uh, and it was really haunting and, and beautiful to hear you speak about them the way that you did. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, in, in looking at so many of these images after the work that you published uh, on the churches and buildings project um, that came out a couple years ago that we celebrated here in a different way um, about the relationship of composition and I would call it maybe aesthetic reference in some of the works. I mean, in some of the works I see, you know, kind of references maybe to Walker Evans or even Wright Morris, um, whereas in others the compositional kind of flow is almost Renaissance-like when you talked about vectors and um, and the kind of triangulation that reminds me of classical um, composition. So I'm wondering how you think about the compositional elements alongside the poetics that you were evoking as you discussed the photographs. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm omnivorous in that respect. It's all interesting, whether it's constructivist, Rodchenko photographs, or Walker Evans, who is, of course, uh, one, of, one of my first shows in Boston back in the late 70s with the Institute of Contemporary Art, which is now in a huge building, it was a small building then. And guess whose photographs were on the upper level? Walker Evans. And Brumfield's on the lower level, that's fine, that's all right, that's, a, that's a, as it should be, uh, Russia. But Russia has always been involved in this, uh, kind of, but in Russia I was supposed to document, I was supposed to get it there, what, what have they done? What does this tell us about their history? That's not the point of lost America. It's not a documentary process, although it exists in many of them in a specific time and place, 
particularly the Roxbury series, but it's more the, the dynamism of the forms, the way it comes together, the joy of that uh, mystery and color and bringing that out and just saying, oh, I've got this. It just works. Uh, and then it's up to the you, the other observer, the observer of the observer, to buy into that. And I think uh, I was really so gratified by the wonderful show at the Shushiv of Lost America last year, how, how Russian colleagues, looking at it without any uh, local preconceptions, saw the things you, you're talking about. They just got that, and they had this, and they didn't ask you what gallery you were affiliated. They just said, "We like this. We're going to put it on." But they wouldn't have done that if I hadn't shown my bona fides going over thousands of miles of Russia photographing the other thing, the documentary project. It's really strange, and we live in tragic times. I don't deny that in the least. We live in very tragic times. But the way these cultures in my life, I'm just a kid who grew up in a North Georgia town. How these things came together and how everything that I listened and the paintings that I saw and the photographs and the works, the novels that I read, uh, how all of that enriches and layers the perception that I would be, whether it's uh, a granite coast in Maine, it's still all brought together in this large presence that every one of us fronts going back however many billions of years you want to do it. We are extraordinary creatures. And what we create and then forget about has a meaning that photography can bring back. We are, we are products of enormous complexity. And I think if photography can get somehow to the mystery of that, the observer of the observer of the thing observed, then I, um, I consider that, uh, well, I did it because I liked it. <laughs> Comments, critiques? Hi, um, my name's Andrew. I had a question Kind of about the eternalness of a photograph that you brought up uh, to, to end your lecture. I think of um, a collection of photos of uh, Storyville women by Balak, yeah, if you're familiar. Uh, yeah. Yes, and, <laughs> indeed I am. <laughs> and those, um, those are kind of emblematic of many photographs that like, maybe it, they weren't going to be eternal in, until they were found by, I think, Lee Friedlander. Yeah, that's and right. Lee Friedlander found them, uh, you know, and uh, just a northerner who came down to New Orleans and uh, found them in a pen. But for those of you who might know, or not know, this, uh, uh, and there was a film made, it was called Pretty Baby, uh, about this collection, uh, of photographs of um, professional in the Storyville era, and he took their, got them to pose, he got their absolute trust uh, and uh, created this extraordinary record of how they wanted to see themselves, I believe, it's safe to say. Um, and it's, um, well, ranks in the, I guess the, the pantheon of, uh, of photography. I mean, you've got portrait photography, if you like, but it goes much beyond that. Yeah, and and most of them are you know water damaged, mold damaged, yeah. uh, have the private parts or even the faces of the women scratched, scratched out, out on the yeah. negative. Yeah, and then I think about uh, many of our own personal photographs that that would be like this, but lost to uh, you know floodwaters or something. Like mo most of my um, family photographs went with a sewer backup in the basement, and so oh, we don't yeah. have them anymore. Yeah, and uh, and. Or, or like uh, poetry journals that go defunct after five years and, and aren't archived anywhere. And so I, I, I guess I question like how, how eternal is photography really? That's my question. Well, uh, that's by the way, uh, if you see Robert Frank's late work, he's actually ripping, after the death of his daughter, he's actually ripping photographs 
just taking a photograph and actually ripping the surface of the photograph itself. Uh, this, this notion of the photograph itself is a very impermanent thing. Um, and the fact that that photograph taken 80 years ago has been so well preserved and now scanned, thanks to the Tulane Library. <laughs> oh, God. And my Tulane students um, is, well, we take what's there. I mean, there is a randomness about the whole thing. Uh, that's part of it. I mean, that's part of the miracle of our system, the existence. The random, and again, I can re refer you to uh, Sarah Amari Walker's book, this random, the process of creating, of ramification, of um, leading to new forms and structures. But <laughs> that's uh, just another aspect of what you're talking about. That, that, that there is a great deal of chance involved in our very being here. Well, you're quite welcome. Yep. So um, you mentioned these sort of degrees of separation between uh, the person viewing the photograph and the photographer and then the mechanical object of the camera and then the unique moment itself. Um, and your photographs are very sort of like carefully composed, they're beautifully composed, um, but there's tremendous detail paid to light, um, to shadow, there are rarely uh, people in them. And uh, I'm just wondering if you uh, choose those compositions so carefully, maybe not only uh, to create a beautiful image, but perhaps to reveal those degrees of mediation um, so as not to purport to be presenting uh, the unique moment itself. Yeah, I, I, again, these photographs should be an indication of a process. Someone did something and then went on. You don't see that person, but you see that something. And that something has, takes on its own existence as it decays and weathers. And there can be little delightful message of humor such as the looking glass against the antique shop and uh, or or the uh, the half shell sign against an abandoned jeep all of these things are just lovely little visual puns uh, which is just sort of the lanyap but the larger purpose or maybe whatever the purpose is they go, we've forgotten about it. Somebody did something and then went on. But there is a transcendental meaning uh, in what is it there, abandoned, left. It's there. And the photograph can take that as the observer chooses. And then you bring your own meaning to it. Hi, Professor Brumfield. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Um, oh, sorry. Yes, I have a question about um, your thoughts on the future of photography. Um, if we look at photographs in the past that were hard to edit, um, they were almost evacuated of narrative, in some cases the documentary photographs, thinking about projects like um, Gerhard Richter's, you know, Uncle Rudy, where you see a photograph and only when you know the context, you really can see more into it. And now with all of the manipulation and mediation tools available to a photographer um, and in the post-production process, we have a whole new era of photography, it seems. So what do you think about this project and how it can exist um, in a history of photography and futurity of photography? Well, I'm, I'm all for new developments, uh, but you know, I'm not gonna use drones, I'm not gonna do this, I am what I did 50 years ago, but one thing I can say for sure, there will always be photons. So how people choose to use and marshal those photons, and it'll always be with human agency directing some technical 
development, right? That will always be there. But I'm very much specific. People ask, do you, do you still do this? No. No. I want to go back to what I've done and gather that together because I think it's meaningful. I think those, those searchings that I you know, went through in the 1970s, that's where the meaning is for me. And I want that to be there, and I am grateful to Tulane students and grateful to Russian colleagues for allowing me to present this material, which I call Lost America. This is a wonderful little side note. The Russians were so sympathetic to the Shusev Museum. They said, oh, how are we going to translate Lost without, in the current context, making it seem something negative about America? They were so sensitive to that. They didn't want it to be manipulated. So they came up with a beautiful, beautiful a solution, which goes right to the transcendental. I decided to call it Tichaya America, Quiet America. I love it. But they're concerned. Oh, we wouldn't want to, any of the translations the Russian have lost might seem that America is negative, but uh, uh, we don't want that. We don't want that for you or about your work. So, Tika. And then, of course, some people in the media said, why are they translated Tika? That's not lost. And then they finally got around to the point, oh, maybe that's what the museum, museum wanted people to think about. Why lost America suddenly becomes quiet America in the translation. Just keep thinking. Just keep thinking about it. Yeah. So, it's a brilliant, brilliant decision, by the way. What I say with Lost America was I had a book called Lost Russia back in, there was a big exhibit of those photographs in New Orleans Museum of Art in 1996. Uh, museum, it started out at Duke University Museum of Art. So I said, well, I've got a Lost Russia. Okay, I'll do a Lost America. But they're different. They're very different in their impulse and subject matter. And, but I still like abandoned things. And Lost Russia was about abandoned country houses, abandoned churches, the beauty of overgrown forms, this collision of nature, and we'll all go back to that. It'll all be overgrown at some point. Uh, every time I look at New Orleans, we're about two years away from being a Mayan ruin, I think. <laughs> um, it's all going to happen, and that that fusion, that collision, I find you know, so stimulating and beautiful. Well, I can't think of a, a better or more poignant way, right, for us to have wrapped up than this sort of intersection of meaning and things moving away from meaning. So please join me once again in congratulating. Thank you. Thank you very much.